first Maccabees chapter 4, verse 41. Let's start there. The book of 1 Maccabees chapter 4, verse 41. Come on. Then Jesus appointed certain men to fight against those that were in fort that were in the fortress until he had cleansed the sanctuary. So our forefather Joel Maccabee, he appointed certain men, our forefathers, the, the high priest that understood the law, that so that they can be able to come in and clean the temple because the heathens had defiled the temple. That's between Antiochus and his crew. You understand? Read verse 41 again. The book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 4, verse 41. Then Judas appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress Come on. Until, until he had cleansed the sanctuary. Until he had cleansed the sanctuary. Read on. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, mm -hmm. such as had pleasure in the law. So the men that our forefather Judah Maccabee chose were those men that had pleasure in the law. They were delighted in keeping God's commandments and upholding it. So they were leading by example. So that's why Judah Maccabee, he surrounded himself with those men that were about the Father's business. So we have to be about our Father's business. You understand? We look at verse 42. The book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 4, verse 42. Read. Really? So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the law. So these priests had blameless conversation. Give me that in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, verse 27. Philippians 1, 27. It says, priests that had that, that, that blameless conversation. Philippians 1 verse 27. The book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. You see that thing? This is a commandment right here. It says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. This is a law. It's not a suggestion. So we are commanded to mind our tongue, to control the things we say and when we say them and how we say them. And around whom we say those things. You understand? Read that part again. The book of first oh, the book of Philippians, the one verse twenty-seven. Come on. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. So it says your conversation must be as the gospel of Christ. Give me that in Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one, verse thirteen. Let's understand what is the gospel of Christ. Read that. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13. Mm -hmm. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. The word of truth. The subject matters are what the word of truth is on. The gospel of your salvation. You see what the gospel of Christ is? The word of truth. The gospel of Christ is the word of truth. The word of truth is the laws of God. God's commandments. So it says our conversation must be according to the laws of God. Not based on what we heard on the radio, not what the next door neighbor was saying last night, you understand? But we're supposed to check those conversations. Because you have control over the things you say. And the things you say, the people that are around you, they're going to tailor their speech based on what you say. But if your speech is loose, your tongue is loose, guess what they're going to do? They're going to be loose around you too. You understand? So we need to lead by example. Read that again, verse 13. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13. Come on. In whom ye also trusted, mm -hmm. after that ye heard the word of truth. The word of truth. That's the gospel of Christ. Go back to where was it? Philippians 1, 27. The book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27. Read. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. You see what he's saying? Let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, meaning according to the laws of God. Because I know it's, um, we, we, we didn't grow up in the law. So now, we don't know how to conduct ourselves in society. That's why we are, the nations are despising us, the nations are treating us like a, we say, like, like, in, like Jeremiah says in Lamentation, we are as a, like a menstruous leg in front of the nations. You understand? Give me that in Lamentations real quick. Lamentations chapter 1. Lamentations 1, verse 17. This is how we are to the nations. This is how they see us. You understand? But it's not about the nations. 
So our focus is not on the nations. Our focus is on the nation of Israel, our people. Read that. Lamentations 1 verse 17. The book of Lamentations, chapter 1 verse 17. Mm -hmm. Zion spread, spreadeth forth her hands. Read. And there is none to comfort her. There is none to comfort Zion. And the other nations don't give a damn about comforting us. That is not their job. We find comfort in the word of God. Read. The Lord hath commanded concerning Jacob that his adversaries should be round about him. Uh -huh. Jerusalem is a menstruous woman among them. You see what he said? He says, Jerusalem is as a menstruous woman among them. Meaning they look at us as a woman that is on her menstrual. We are unclean before his nations. That is how the nations look at us. But it's up to us to change that. And the most High God is giving us the blueprint on how to do that. You understand? Go back to uh, Philippians 1, verse 27. The book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27. Come on. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. You see that? Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That is why I'm working on this, is because of this. This is what we are used to doing. Give it up to Leviticus 19. This is what we are used to doing, and the Lord, the most of God, He gave us the law on how to deal with this thing. Leviticus 19, verse 16. The book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 16. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. You see that thing? He says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Meaning, mm -hmm. don't be gossiping. So, we discord among the people. So that's a law. And that's something that we as a people, this is like nature, it's like it comes, it comes naturally to us to cause confusion. So the Lord is saying, read it again, this is a law. Read that. The book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 16. Uh -huh. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Uh -huh. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. You see that thing? When you become a talebearer, when you go sin, the Lord says, you see that last part, that last part again? It says, Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. Because when you tell them, when you gossip, when you speak evil of other members, guess what happens? The most of God says, you are, you, are, you are like a murderer in his eyes. Because you are not applying that way of law. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. <coughs> you understand? So go back to Philippians 1. Verse 27 again. The book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Come on. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Read. Really? That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear I may hear of your affairs. Mm -hmm. That ye stand fast in this in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That is what every brother, every brother and sister must be. You must, you must stand for the laws of God. You must defend the gospel by any lawful means. Not by any means, by any lawful means. You must defend the gospel. You see your brother next to you malfunctioning? You must be the first line of defense. You must listen, bro. You are out of order. This is not in the spirit. Get it together. Because if you allow him to go into sin and you can recognize it, guess whose, whose blood is going to be on? His blood is going to be on your hands. Because you will say nothing. You see your brother's malfunctioning, but you're just quiet. You see, that means you are evil. Give it up to me because I don't want. Watch this. This is a law that the Lord gave unto us. You see evil, you must help your brother. Don't keep quiet and let your brother die in his sins. Because I don't want. The book of Leviticus, chapter 5, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and it and is a witness. And you are a witness. Maybe you are you can witness this thing. You see your brother going off, but you don't say nothing. Read. Whether he have seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. You see that thing? That's why in the black community they call it uh they say no, we don't snitch. You see something going on, you don't say nothing. Then you see that last part when it says, Then he shall bear his iniquity. The Lord says, because you don't say nothing, I'm going to bring judgment on you. Because you see, but you don't say nothing. You keep quiet. So the Lord is saying, 
the judgment is going to come on you. That's why you notice that black people just keep dropping dead. There's gang violence, you understand? Abortion clinics all over the place, abortion slaughterhouses, excuse me. You understand? But don't nobody say nothing. So now people are going to keep dying because the world keeps bringing judgment because brothers and sisters says, we don't snitch. I'm not going to say nothing. But you see the evil, you just keep quiet. That's why the community is in a mess like this. You understand? Because you see something wrong, you won't say nothing. But you know what the law says. You understand? That means you are evil. Because you are afraid that if you address it, that means you, your evil also will come out. Our job is to examine ourselves. So that when you see something, you address it. Don't be afraid that oh no, but nobody, according to the law, this is not correct. So let's fix it. We are all here who try to get to the kingdom. This is not the kingdom of heaven. This is way, this is a need to get to the kingdom. And the way to do that is to get ourselves right. Let's go back to Philippians 1, verse 27 again. The book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27. Mm -hmm. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Really? That whether I come and see you or whether or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So now, our forefathers, don't lose the point now. Our forefathers, John Maccabee says, he chose priests of blameless conversation. Meaning what? They are about the Father's business. They are about the words of God. You understand? That's why we came here. Because they understood the law that we read in Leviticus 1916. Don't be a tail bearer. You see that thing? Go back to first part of this book. Let's go to again. The book of first Maccabees, chapter 4, verse 42. Mm -hmm. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the law. They had pleasure in the law. Meaning what? It was it's a joy for them to observe the laws of God. It wasn't something that was, you know, just like, oh gosh. Really, do I have to do this again? Every, every Sabbath? Must I stop buying? Must I stop cooking? No. They had pleasure in the law. They were not complaining about not buying or not selling. They were looking, in fact, they were looking forward to it. That is the spirit we all must have in this truth. You need to find something in this truth that is going to be able to be your anchor. That no matter what is happening, listen, this is the key. This is something I need to hold on to. If it's seeing your enemies go down, listen, if that's something that is letting you hold on in this truth, guess what? You hold on to it. Because if you want to see your enemies go down, guess what? The spirit that will come upon you said, what do I need to do in order for me to see that thing? I need to examine myself. I need to apply the words of God. Then you see the, the, the destruction of your enemies. You understand? But as long as you are in here because the white man is the devil, you're not going to last. Because the white man, he's doing, he's righteous in his own right. The person like created him like that. Just be evil, just cause confusion on the earth. Yes, of course, he does it. So, we were given a law to follow, but we're not doing it. You understand? So don't come here because the white man is the devil. The Bible is bigger than that. You understand? Our families are broken. Uh, brothers are hooked up on drugs. Nyaupe is killing our sons and our daughters. We see them, brothers, Midland, uh, Victoria. It's all over the place. Alex, the visa kind of thing. Listen, our people are hooked up on these things. So you need to see that and say, where do we are going to scriptures to actually address this problem? That's how a leader thinks. You understand? You see a problem, I need to fix it. We identify the problem, the most of God allows us to have a camp. That helps us to go out there because we see the problems in our people. We see the problems in our community. And we are given by what is written because we see the solutions in the Bible. Definite solutions. You understand? Um, read on, verse 43. Verse 43. Who cleansed the sanctuary and bear out the defiled stones into an unclean place. So now, Judah Maccabee, he chose this priest that we there, pleasure in the law, to cleanse the sanctuary. That is what this is about. The feast of dedication is about the cleansing of the sanctuary, the cleansing of the temple. So you, you have to ask yourself, why was it necessary for the temple to be cleansed? 
We went over this, but I want to go in a different direction today. Even though the first of is one and one, I'm going to touch on a little bit of history, and then um, we're going to go into the true understanding of um, why we need to observe the Feast of Dedication today in the lens of activity. What is the benefit of doing that? First Maccabees 1 and 1. The book of 1 Maccabees chapter 1 verse 1. And it happened after that Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, the Macedonian, mm -hmm. who came out of the land of Chittim. Chittim is Rome. So Chittim is making reference to Rome. He was a hostage in Rome. Read. Who came out of the land of Chittim had smitten Darius, king of the Persians, and Medes. Read. That he reigned in his stead the first over Greece. So now Alexander, the so-called great, he was the king of Greece. He was the first king of Greece. The year it was around 333 BC. So write that down. Around 333 BC, that's when Alexander took the throne. Read. Verse 2. And made many wars and won many strongholds and slew the kings of the earth. So when Alexander took over, he was conquering everybody. You understand? He was conquering everybody. That's why he says he made many wars and won many strongholds and slew the kings of the earth. He was killing. He was killing, conquering, putting nations under his subjection. You understand? Read. And went through the ends of the earth and took spoils of many nations. You see that thing? That's what we read last night in Daniel 11 verse 28. They would, they would do exploits and take the spoils of the nations and take them back to their own countries. You understand? America's doing the same thing today. Read on. In so much that the earth was quiet before him, Read. whereupon he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. He was powerful in his court. Read on. And he gathered a mighty strong host mm -hmm. and ruled over countries and nations and kings who became tributaries unto him. You see that part when he says, um, and he gathered a mighty strong host, he had an army, and ruled over countries and nations and kings. Guess what? If you look at what America does today, America rules the whole earth. But America is not going to be everywhere at once. Guess what they do? They set up kings. They call the president. The president in South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, he reports to who? He reports to the West. You understand? The Chinese president. The, the French president and so forth. The list goes on and on and on. That's why he says, uh, and nations and kings. So he ruled over these kings. And they became tributaries unto him. They paid him taxes, colonial tax. Because they were under subjection of Greece now. Read verse 5. And after these things, he fell sick and perceived that he should die. Because what Alexander was doing, he was sleeping with his, with his generals. The men that went to war with him, Alexander was sleeping with them. He got sickness and he dropped dead because of that thing. That's why they used to wear those metal, um, like it's like a metal underwear. So that his penis does not touch anything because sickness makes your penis to be sensitive. That's why he was walking around with a metal underwear all over the place. You understand? And wearing the skirt too. Read. Wherefore he called his servants, such as were honorable, and had been brought up with him from his youth, Read. and parted his kingdom among them while he was yet alive. So, before Alexander died, he parted his kingdom among four generals. He parted his kingdom among four generals. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list the four generals uh, that Alexander parted his kingdom among. The first is Cassander. Cassander. So write that down. Cassander. That is the first general. Cassander was ruling over Macedonia and Greece. One of Alexander's first general is Cassander. Cassander. He ruled over Macedonia or Macedon and Greece. The second one is Lysimachus. L Y S I N A C H U S. Lysimachus. Lysimachus, he took over Thrace and Asia Minor. I'm going to repeat it again. Lysimachus, he took over Thrace and Asia Minor. The third one was Ptolemy. Ptolemy, P T O. L E M W E. 
They turn me. They turn me to an Egypt. They turn me to an Egypt. The next one was Seleucus or Seleucus. S E L E U C U S. Let me repeat it again. S E L E U C U S. Seleucus or Seleucus. Seleucus took over Syria, Babylon, and Persia. Seleucus took over Syria, Babylon, and Persia. So when Alexander died, he made sure that the Greek Empire continued on. You understand? So he parted his kingdom among his four generals. The, the four generals that we just mentioned. Alright? Um, give me first Maccabees chapter 1, verse 10. We're going to jump down to verse 10. I'm just going to touch on a, a few points because the, the reason why I asked why was it necessary for the temple to be cleansed, I'm taking you on a little journey. Alexander took over, he planted his kingdom among four generals. Out of those four generals, there was, a, there was one of them called Seleucus. Antiochus comes out of the Seleucus dynasty. This is Greek history, so just pay close attention. Uh, 1 Maccabees 1 verse 10. The book of 1 Maccabees chapter 1 verse 10. Read. And there came out of them wicked root, a wicked root, Antiochus, surnamed Epiphanes, son of Antiochus the king, who had been an hostage at Rome, and he reigned in the hundred and thirty and seventh year of the kingdom of the Greeks. You see that thing? So Antiochus, he comes out of the Seleucus dynasty, by the way. Watch this. Give me that in Second Maccabees 4. Second Maccabees chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, let me see. Second Maccabees chapter 4, verse 7. The book of Second Maccabees, chapter 4, verse 7. Read. But after the death of Seleucus, when Antiochus, called Epiphanes, took the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Onias, labored underhand to the high priest. To be high priest. So Jason was an Israelite. He wanted to be a high priest, but he, was, he, wanted, to get, he wanted to get his priesthood through bribes. You understand? So that's what he was doing. But the key here is that Antiochus comes out of the Seleucid Empire. You understand? Let's go back. First Maccabees 1, verse 10 again. The book of First Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 10. Mm -hmm. And there came out of them a wicked root. Read. Antiochus, surnamed Epiphanes, son of Anti Antiochus the king, who had been an hostage in Rome. And he reigned in the hundred and thirty and seventh year of the kingdom of the Greeks. Jump down to verse 17. Verse 17. Mm -hmm. Wherefore he entered into Egypt with a great multitude, with chariots and elephants and horsemen and a great navy. So now, this is Antiochus now. Antiochus, remember, who is ruling over the Greek or over Egypt? The Ptolemy. The Ptolemy is over, the, it, it, it is over Egypt. But Antiochus is coming to take over also. Because Alexander's generals, they were competing for power, by the way. So as soon as Alexander died, their true colors came out. That's why when Antiochus took over, he, 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 went, he said, listen, I'm going to conquer everything. So he took over Egypt from the Ptolemy, one of Alexander's generals. Um, read, read on. And made war against Ptolemy king of Egypt, but Ptolemy was afraid of him really? and fled, and many were wounded to death. So, uh, Antiochus was killing everybody, you understand? Even if it was his own, because he was what? Thirsty for power and dominion. Read. Verse 19, thus, thus they got the strong cities in the land of Egypt, and he took the spoils thereof. Read. And after that, Antiochus had smitten Egypt, he returned again in the hundred forty and third year, and went up against Israel and Jerusalem with a great multitude, Read. and entered proudly into the sanctuary, and took away the golden altar, and the candlestick of light, and all the vessels thereof. You see what Antiochus did? After he took over, he took over a petrology, his dynasty, he went for the children of Israel now. He went for our forefathers. 
He returned, he went to the children of Israel at Jerusalem with a great multitude. He says he ate and entered probably into the sanctuary, you understand, the temple, and took away the golden altar and the candlestick, which is the menorah, that's what it's called, and all the vessels they all, meaning what? The things that the priests use in order for them to perform their priestly duties in terms of sacrificing. You understand? Because at this point, the law of animal sacrifice was still in play. So we had to observe it. But they went to the temple because they know that that's where we get our power. That's where we communicate with the Father. So if they cut that off, we have nothing. You understand? We know? Verse 21. Verse 21. And entered proudly into the sanctuary and took away the golden altar and the candlestick of light and all the vessels thereof. Read. And the table of the shoe bread and the pouring vessels and the and the veils and the senses of gold and the veil and the crowns and the golden ornaments that were before the temple all which he pulled off so he took all of them he took our he took our precious things that pertain to the temple that belong to the temple he took all of them really he took also the silver and the gold and the precious vessels also he took the hidden treasures which he found. Come on. And when he taken all away, when he had taken all away, he went into his own land, having made a great massacre, and spoken very proudly. You see that there's a pattern here. You notice in the book of Daniel, Daniel is saying the same thing. When you read Deuteronomy 28, verse 33, the fruit of their land and all their land, they take everything. You understand? They don't need nothing. That is what we are reading here. They take everything and they kill everyone. If they don't kill everyone, they kill most of the people that they call and take their spoils from them. So that's why it's a read this verse 24 again. The book of 1st Maccabees, chapter 1 to 4. Read. And when he had taken all away, he went into his own land, having a great massacre, mm -hmm. and spoken very proudly. Jump down to verse 29. Verse 29, and after two years fully expired, the king sent his chief collector of tribute unto the cities of Judah, really? who came unto Jerusalem with a great multitude. So now he returned after two years into Jerusalem, because the first time he came, he took everything of ours. Then two years later, he returns now. Guess what he wants? Tribute, tax, colonial tax. Read. Really? And speak peaceable words unto them, but all was deceit. You see that thing? He was trying to batter them, but our forefathers could see through that thing. Read. And when he had taken the spoils of the city, no, no, read the stage again. Oh. And he spake peaceable words unto them, but all was deceit. Read. For when they had given him credence, credence, credence he fell suddenly upon the city and smote it very sore and destroyed much people of Israel. You see what he was doing? So what Antiochus was doing, he came back two years later and our forefathers were still in the spirit of saying, listen, we don't like what you're doing. We hate what you're doing. But he still saw that they still have the spirit and the will to fight. So he said, listen, I need to make sure that I bring their spirit so that they don't even try to go against me. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's trying to do. If they call it psychological warfare. That's what Antiochus was doing. You understand? Jump down to verse 35. Verse 35. Mm -hmm. They stored it also with armor and victuals or victuals. And when they had gathered together the spoils of Jerusalem, they laid them up there, and so they became a source name. You see that thing? So what they did is they decided, you know what, we're going to put a garrison around the temple. Meaning we're going to put a military around the temple so that the children of Israel do not come in to do their sacrifices. But guess what? There was cruelty among the Greeks. Those of our, our people that were fighting with the Greeks. You understand? They were living large. Everything was good for them. Because they were sold to do this shit to go against the laws of God. It's the same thing going on today with the Christian church and the pastors, the politicians. They are all bought and paid for and give plans. You understand? Read on. Verse 36. 
for it was a place to lie in wait against, against the sanctuary and an evil adversary to Israel. So now, you see that thing? Is as an evil adversary to Israel. Evil is an evil adversary to Israel. That's what we are reading here. All the nations are evil, but evil is on the top. Because evil, the nations don't know without evil say so. The nations don't know without America say so. Let me make it plain like that. If, if any nation goes against America, guess what happened to that country? They lose, they lose their money. There's a civil war. You understand? They send them into starvation. You understand? The currency is devalued. They send economic hitmen into the country to assassinate and kill by any means. Because you go against America. Greece was like that. Rome was like that. Spain, France, Germany, Britain, all of them, they are just like that. They operate the same way because it's the same people. You understand? Uh, read verse 37. Watch this. Verse 37. Thus they shed innocent blood on every side of the sanctuary and defiled it. You see that thing? They were killing our, our forefathers. He says they were shed, they shed innocent blood on every side of the sanctuary and they defiled it. Read. Insomuch that the inhabitants of Jerusalem fled because of it. Read. Whereupon the city was made an habitation of strangers and became strange to those that were born in her. Mm -hmm. And her own children left her. You see, he says, you will become a stranger in your own land. Isn't that what's going on today? Because you never say, no, but Africa is ours, it's our motherland. But you are a stranger here. You understand? There are other nations come here, they take the land, they take the resources, and they put you to work on your own land and give them all the spoils. That is what's going on today. They call it colonization. Simply put, oppression. You understand? That is what we are reading here. Read on. Verse 39. Her sanctuary was laid waste like a wilderness. Her feasts were turned into mourning. Her servants into a reproach. Mm -hmm. Her honor into contempt. We were no longer keeping our Sabbath no more. We were no longer sacrificing into the temple because the priests had taken over it and they were divided the temple. Read. As had been her glory, so was her dishonor increased, and her excellency was turned into mourning. Come on. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. That's the, that's the continuance of democracy. Because democracy didn't start with Antiochus. Democracy started with Pleistines. There was a man that was, was a Greek and <coughs> a white man in 508 BC. He's the one that started democracy. They held the first election in 508 BC in Greece, Athens. You understand? So Antiochus just continued what his forefathers was doing. It wasn't nothing new at this point, but he enforced it more. He Hellenized everybody. He enforced our forefathers to become Greeks and to call themselves by the names of the Greeks, to eat their divine food, to dress skanky and all of that. That's what's going on today. Isn't that what's going on today? With our sons and our daughters, our fathers and mothers. It's the same thing. Our sisters and brothers, the same thing going on today. It was going on back then. You see that thing? Come on. And everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandments of the king. You see that thing? Everyone should leave his laws. And all the heathen agreed to this thing. Because the people that was given the words was us. But it wasn't just us only that um, Antiochus wanted to be under, the, under his subject, subjection. He wanted everybody to be under his subjection. Because if everybody is moving in one accord, guess what? Nobody's going to revolt. Everybody's going to be kept happy. You understand? They're going to keep you occupied. Whether if, if entertainment is your thing, you're going to be occupied in them. If sports is your thing, you're going to take part in them. If politics is your thing, you're going to be caught up in them. You understand? They will keep you happy to indulge in your sin. That's the kingdom we're living in today. It's a repeat. Read. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion. You see that? 
many also of the Israelites, our forefathers, they were okay, they were in agreement with the Greek, the, the religion of the Greeks, which is what? Democracy. Democracy is a religion of the Greeks. So today when our, our brothers in politics, your EFFs, your ATs and all of that, and they're saying that we are fighting oppression, they are practicing the religion of our oppressors. You see that thing? That's why nothing has changed. That's why we're still in the same condition, if not worse. Because they're still continuing to, they're using the system that the oppressor has set up to fight oppression. That's not going to happen. You understand? You know? Yet many also of the Israelites consented to his religion mm -hmm. and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. Come on. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah that they should follow the strange laws of the land. Like for instance, uh, in the US they celebrate Thanksgiving. Today here, here we will, our people are celebrating what? Uh, Christmas. Christmas is coming up. That's why we are reading here says, um, read that part again, that bottom precept again, that they should what? That they should follow the strange laws of the land. Christmas is a strange law of the land because the Lord didn't give us Christmas. New Year is a strong, is, 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 a, is a strange law of the land because the Lord didn't give us that. He gave us Passover, which happens in March. That's the beginning of our year that the Lord gave unto us. So the, 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 first, the first of January is not the new year. You see that? So we are following the strange laws of the land. You see that thing? Read. And forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple, and that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days. You see that thing? Now on, on the Sabbath, our people are praying, they are celebrating uh, birthdays, you understand? They are going to watch soccer. They do all manner of things on the Sabbath day. Read. And pollute the sanctuary and holy people. You see that thing? Now as a people we are polluted, and now we are defiled. Because we are following the strange laws of the land. Not what the Lord gave us. So the Lord says, do not delight in that thing. You see that thing? Read. Set up altars and groves mm -hmm. and chapels of idols. You see that? Mm -hmm. And sacrifice swine's flesh mm. and unclean beasts. So they took what, because they had control of the temple, guess what they were doing? They were sacrificing pig, pork in our temple. Because pork is unclean when it comes to uh, the law, the, the animals that the Lord gave unto us that He sanctified for us to use to, do, uh, to perform our sacrifices. But they were, they were sacrificing unclean animals in our temples. Give me that in uh, 2 Maccabees 6 verse 4. 2 Maccabees 6 verse 4. Let's see what else they did in our temple. I just wanted to take you through that little bit of history then we're going to go into the spiritual understanding of them. We're going to go to the world now. But before we get there, I just want to give you an, an example. Another thing that there are other things that they did to defile our temple. 2 Maccabees 6 verse 4. The book of 2nd Second, Second Maccabees, chapter 6, verse 4. Come on. For the temple was filled with riot and revelry. You see that? It was filled with riot and revelry. Parties and all of that. You understand? Read. For the temple was filled with riot and revelry by the Gentiles. By the Greeks. Read. Who dallied with harlots. They were having orgies in our temples. You understand? They were dealing with prostitutes in our temples. Read. And had to do with women within the circuit of the holy places. The circuit of the holy places is making reference to where we put our holy, our holy things. The temple of shipwreck, the candlestick, the minimum, the minora. Where those, where those things were placed for us to perform our holy sacrifices, guess what they were doing? They were having orgies in place of that. In our temples. You understand? That's some evil stuff. Guess what? You cannot go past that. Look at what's happening today in the Christian church. What's the difference? Because it's the same thing. When brothers want to look for a woman to sleep with, guess where they go? Church. That's when they don't go to the club normal. They go to church. 
And guess what? They invite them. Because the same women that go to church, guess what they go, they go there for? To look for men. You see how this goes? All evil stuff here. Read. And besides that brought in things that were unlawful. They were bringing things that were not lawful. You understand? Like swine's flesh, harlots, prostitutes in our temples. Read. The altar also was filled with profane things which the law forbidden. Which the law forbidden. Now watch this. Now let's fast forward now. Let's go to Rome. Give me Luke 21 verse 20. Luke chapter 21 verse 20. Let's see what Christ said about the temple. The book of Luke chapter 21 verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. You see that thing? So Christ was warning us of the destruction of Jerusalem before it happened. So he was prophesying that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by the Romans. You understand? Watch this. Matthew 24 verse 1. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1. Christ prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem. Watch this. The book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 1. Read. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So he was showing them the building of the temple, right? He was looking at the actual physical building because at this point, the temple wasn't destroyed yet. It was still standing. Read. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, they shall be not, they shall not be left here one stone upon another. That shall not be thrown down. So Christ was saying, listen, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Completely. That's what he was saying. There is no stone that is will not be thrown down. Everything is going to be laid waste by the Romans. He was saying that the temple was going to be destroyed. Watch this now. Give me the book of First Corinthians chapter 3 now. Verse Corinthians 3, verse 16. The temple is destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. We went over this class. Now, Christ is prophesied about that thing. That Jerusalem will be destroyed. Those of you that are in Judea, flee to the mountain, meaning run deeper into Africa and hide. You understand? Those that are not in Jerusalem do not return. You understand? Because these be the days of vengeance. That all things that are written must be fulfilled. Watch this. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Now let's understand. Since the temple was destroyed, now what is the temple that now we need to cleanse? You understand? Ourselves now. Our bodies, that's the temple that we need to deal with. We need to cleanse that temple. You understand? First Corinthians 3, verse 16. The book of First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Uh -huh. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Come on. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So now, we are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in us. What is the Spirit of God? The commandment, the Spirit of Christ. You understand? The laws of God. Read again verse 16. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16. Uh -huh. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So the Spirit of God dwells in us. Watch this. We're going to come back here. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. This is not going to be a long class. So I know everybody's hungry, you want to eat. So you know. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. Watch this. The book of 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. Uh -huh. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Read. Which ye have of God and ye are not your own. You see what the Apostle Paul is saying? He says you are not your own. Your body don't belong to you. Because a lot of the times we are taught in the world in the world that no, this is my body. I can do whatever I want with it. Oh no. Wrong. That's not our bodies. You understand? The person of God, he gave you this body, he's borrowed. He's not your don't belong to you. You cannot do whatsoever you think is best for it. You must do it, you must treat it and conduct yourself according to what is written. Do it according to the manual that was given to you. You understand? Read. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body uh -huh. and in your spirit, 
which are God. You see that thing? She says, therefore glorify God in your body. You must glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So your spirit and your body don't belong to you. It belongs to the Messiah. And the Messiah God gave us guidelines on how to cleanse our temple. Meaning you don't define it with your lust, your evil thoughts, the lust that you want to get rid of in your life. Don't define it like that. You understand? Go back to where you were saying. 1 Corinthians 3.16. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16. Uh -huh. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Watch this. Keep going to Solomon 1. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 1 and verse 5. Wisdom of Solomon 1 and 5. Start at verse 4. Read verse 4. That's why I want to you. The book of wisdom of Solomon chapter 1 verse 4. Come on. For into a malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter. Come on. Nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. You see what the Lord is saying? It says, into a malicious soul, an unstable soul, an undisciplined soul, it says, wisdom will not enter. It nor will it dwell in a body that is subject unto sin. Because if you give your body to sin, because your flesh is only lasting for things. But if you give your flesh the things that it lasts for, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get destroyed. You're going to die. Because the Lord will bring forth judgment on you. You understand that? No. Yes, oh, praises. Read it again, verse 4. The book of Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4. Come on. For into a malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter. Come on. Nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. A body that is subject unto sin is that. Listen, your body will tell you I'm used to this. So the Lord says, mm -mm, don't do that. So now you have to make a decision. Are you going to respond to your flesh or are you going to respond to based on what is written? Because your flesh will always be fighting the laws of God in the you keeping good of commandments. Understand, it's going to be a fight. It's not going to be easy. Because your body is used to certain lusts and your body is used to you giving it certain lusts whenever it wants. Now when you come into this truth, your fight, that's when your fight begins. Where you have to say, no, I'm not going to give my flesh what it wants. Because it might feel good right now, but in the future, in the long run, it's going to put me, it's going to get me dead. So you have to appeal to the most high God to move like that. You understand that? All right, let's go back to what was that? First Corinthians 6, uh, no, First Corinthians 3, verse 16. The book of First Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 16. Mm -hmm. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, Come on. and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The only way when the, the Spirit, the only time that the Spirit of God will dwell in us is when we don't, our, we don't subject our bodies to sin. We don't just, we, 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 we stop fighting. You understand? We stop fighting and say, you know what? Listen, I've been struggling with this thing. It's not going away, so I don't know what else to do. Listen, you have to fast. You have to get into the habit of fasting. You have to get into the habit of praying. Because a lot of us, we don't really pray in the right way. That's why we went over the prayer and fasting class so you can know how to pray and how to fast. Because there's certain sins, there will be strongholds on all of us. The only way to get rid of it, you need to fast. That's the only way. If you don't fast, that thing will always knock you out in the first round all the time. And you're going to get frustrated, you're going to say, you know what? Listen, this Bible is not true here. And there's no power in this book. No. It's because you're, are you doing the things that are necessary for you to come out of it? Because you can't say, you know what? I want to lose weight. Okay, but at 12 o'clock at night you're eating McDonald's now. Is that going to happen? It happens. So you have to do things necessary to in order for you to achieve that goal. One of those goals you have to fast. Because when you fast, guess what? Fasting is 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 a, is, is is symbolic that you can if you can deny your body food and water, the basic things it needs. That means you have the power to stop the sin that you have. 
That's the example behind fasting. If for 24 hours, right, you know that you are a gambler, but for 24 hours you say, you know what, I'm not going to go to the casino, I'm going to be in the Bible, I'm going to study. That means you can do it. You see that? That means you can, but you can't get it done. But a lot of the times, because we don't believe the Bible, we're like, yeah, you know, but I, I don't really get it. You know why? Because you don't come to the place like, well, decided. You come to him already, you already have doubts. Already. So, guess what? You're not going to succeed him. Because already you are thinking it's not going to work. Yeah, you are right. Whether you say it's going to work or it's not going to work, either way you are correct. So that's why he says, when you come to him, don't be wavering him. Know exactly what you want and go through it. The Lord says, I'm going to be with you. But if you are, mm, I'm not sure, the Lord says, okay, I'm also just going to sit back and watch. You see that? So we don't want that. So if you want to clean your temple, you have to be deliberate here. You have to make a decisive decision. I want to do this. Come here or high water. And guess what's going to happen? The minute you start to apply, the people that are used to you doing certain things, you're going to see their true colors come out. I'm telling you. Because they are used to you doing certain things, but the minute you say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. No, I'm not going to eat that. Then they're going to fight you. They're going to go through those five stages of, of grief. You know, anger. You know, hatred. Then they're going to start to negotiate bargaining. You know, yeah, you know, do that part, I'm going to do this part. You know, if you do that thing, you see, they start to bargain with you. Then they get to a point where it's called acceptance. They, they have to get to there, but they, you must allow them to go through those five stages. Yeah. If you don't, listen, you'll always be only stuck in the middle. Because that means you really don't want to get over this thing. You understand that? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. From there, give me First Peter 2 verse 5. First Peter chapter 2 verse 5. Because we're still dealing with the cleansing of the temple. First Peter 2 verse 5. Watch this. The book of First Peter, chapter 2, verse 5. Uh -huh. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Remember, the physical temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now we have the spiritual temple. That's us. We are the temple of God now. You understand? Because what was done in the temple? There were sacrifices that was being done, you understand? Prayers were being set up, sin offerings, uh, peace offerings, and so forth. Guess what? Our goal is now is the temple. So in order for us to still do the same spirit, uh, the same sacrifices, now they are spiritual sacrifices now. You understand? So how do we do that? How do we build that spiritual house? We build that spiritual house by offering up spiritual sacrifices unto the most high God. I'm going to go into that. How we do that? Give me Sarah 35 verse 1. Um, I think everybody knows this one. Sarah 35 and verse 1. This is how, this is the first step in understanding what it means to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to the most high God through Jesus Christ. Sarah 35 verse 1. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 35 verse 1. Mm -hmm. He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. He that what? He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. So if you keep God's commandments, that's your offering. That is those spiritual sacrifices or offerings that you have to bring up in order for you to build that spiritual house. You understand? To build it and maintain it. So we have to keep the laws of God. We have to observe. Like for instance, now observing the feast of dedication, this is a law. Because a lot of times um, I've noticed on the group, people take the feast for granted. Listen, you observing the feast, there's a spiritual growth that happens in you. Because the Lord says, listen, this brother, this sister is seeing the importance of this feast. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to increase them in this truth. They want to start to have understanding of this Bible. They want to start to know how to apply the Bible the right way. You understand? The first side God is not oblivious to what's going on. He sees that. He sees that we are trying. 
You understand? Does, does one again? The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 35, verse 1. Read. He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. Come on. He that taketh heed to the commandment offereth a peace offering. You see that? You will have peace between you and the Father. You know how you know how nice it is working without working without living your life looking over your shoulder all the time. There's nothing less that thing is priceless. There's nothing so peaceful than that thing. You're like a baby on vodka. I'm not saying you give your baby vodka, but I'm just saying like, listen, that's a peaceful life. Knowing that the whole side God is with me. I'm doing anything and everything lawfully to make sure that I please him. Because when you keep God's commandments, guess what? Let me show you what happens in the spirit when you come into this truth. Uh, give me the book of Job. Here's what happens in the spirit world when you repent and keep God's commandments. Job 1 verse 6. Actually, you know what? Before we get Job, we're going to get Job, so hold that, don't forget that point. Give me Sarah 2 verse 1. Ecclesiasticus. Chapter 2 verse 1. Let me show you what happens in the spirit world when you keep God's commandments. When you come into this truth and say, you know what? I'm going to serve the most high God now. Sarah 2 verse 1. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 2, verse 1. Come on. My son, if thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. He says you must prepare your soul, prepare your spirit to be tempted. So is this an opinion or a fact? It's a fact. You will be tempted when you come into this truth. Because now you, you want to serve the one true God, the God of Israel. You understand? John 1 and 6. This is what happens when you decide to say, you know what? I want to apply now. Here's what happens. Job 1 and 6. The book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6. Uh -huh. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So Satan, is that Satan came also among them. Because there's a doctrine in the Christian church where they say, no, God had a fight with Satan. No, no. Satan, what? God, shouldn't the Lord be asking Satan, what are you doing here? Didn't I kick you a long time ago? He's not asking. That's not what's going on here. Is that Satan came also among them, meaning the most high God and Christ and the angels, they were discussing things. Satan was among them also. Listen to the conversation now. Watch this. Verse 7. So there was no such thing that God kicked Satan out of heaven. That didn't happen. Verse 7. Uh -huh. And the Lord said unto Satan, Read. Really? When comest thou? Now you see now the conversation. The Lord said unto Satan, Where do you come from? Read. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, uh -huh. From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So Satan can travel up and down in the earth whenever he pleases. He can go back to the heavenly father because he's up there too. Because Satan is an employee. He works for the Lord. I know that's very difficult to understand, but that's biblical. Satan is an employee of the Father. Watch this. Give me Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. We can be back. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, the son. The book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 7. I form the light uh -huh. and create darkness. Mm -hmm. I make peace uh -huh. and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You see what God says he does? He says he creates evil. So you need to tell me, because remember, the most high God is called the Almighty God. All power, all knowing. You need to tell me that he created everything and Satan is just going to be, you know, jacking and diving. No! He's an employee who works for the Lord. Because the most high God in the heavens, guess what? On the right hand, there's good angels. On the left hand is the evil angels. Their job is to bring forth judgment here. You go up on the scriptures, a car just comes and hits you here. Because, guess what? The angel said, I'm going to go down there and cause that eagle to be put to death. That's Bible. So, when, because a lot of the times when they teach the Christian church, they say, when things go bad in your life, no, that's Satan. No, that's not Satan. The Lord allowed that thing to go down. And the angels discuss 
They say, no, I want to go down there. Another one says, I want to go. Another one says, I want to go. And the Lord listens to the council and says, okay, let me hear who has a diabolical plan here. He listens, okay, you can go. He goes down there and he will accomplish it. Why? Because he's all power. This is the Bible. Go back to Job now, chapter 1. Job chapter 1 to 7 again. The book of Job chapter 1 to 7. Uh -huh. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking, and from walking up and down in it. Come on. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Stop right there. You see the conversation now? It says, The Lord asked Satan, Where do you come from? He says, From walking up and down in the earth. Who is in the earth? Us. We dwell here on earth. So now the Lord is asking Satan now. says, The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? When you come to serve the Lord, guess what conversation is here up in there in the heavens? Have you considered my servant Ganka? That's what's going on here. Have you considered my servant Jehovah? That's the conversation that goes down. So when you say you're coming to serve the Lord, Satan have a conversation with the Lord. And Satan will always say, nah, that one don't, they don't really believe you. Take everything they call you and see. You see the two colors come up. Just say, just mess their life up. You want to see. That's the conversation that is held up there in the heavens. You know, verse 8 again. The book of Job chapter 1 verse 8. Come on. And the Lord said unto Satan, uh -huh. Hast thou considered my servant Job? Read. That there is none like him in the earth. Read. A perfect man and an upright man. One that feareth God and ensueth evil. You see that thing? So the Lord is saying, listen, Job is my son. He's perfect. He keeps the commandments. He fears me. He hates evil. Watch the next part. Here's Satan's response now. Verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? So Satan is saying, Listen, this guy, he fears you because what? He doesn't fear you for nothing. He's going to explain what he means by that. You know? Has thou, has not thou made an hedge about him? Meaning what? The reason why he fears you is because, the reason why he worships you. The reason why he succeeds because you are protecting him. He's wealthy, everything is good in his life. That's why he serves him sincerely. Read. Has thou not has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Read. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. Come on. And his substance is increased in the land. You see what he said? His substance made Job was wealthy. He wasn't poor, he was wealthy. So Satan is telling the, the Lord, say, listen, the reason why he is so painful is because you are protecting him and you have blessed the work the, 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 the works of his hand. Just take everything he's gone. You're gonna see his true colors come out. Guess what? The same way the conversation is had about you when you come into this truth, is the, the same conversation continues about you in this truth. He says, you know what? Take his job, you see. Make him lose his job. You're going to see the true colors come out. Just do that. Take away his, take his children away, you'll see. Take his wife away, you'll see. Take, his, take the husband, you're going to see the true color come out. So, you can, you're not going to get, we, we will not get the kingdom for free. It's, the, it's the impossible. So, you need to understand that the importance of, of us repenting. Because it's so powerful that the, the Lord is even having a conversation with Satan up there about you. So you really need to let that sink in your spirit. To understand that every single day your angel is sitting right, is sitting right next to you. The more you push in this truth, you're going to start to see some shadows next to you. Yes. You're going to look at the corner, the corner of your eye, you see your angel standing right there, but you just want to see a shadow. He is walking around with books about you. Everything you do, you understand? That nigga right there. You see, the things that you do, you think nobody's seeing you, he's writing them down there. Yeah. And he takes the elevator, he goes up. He says, you see, you see, look what he's doing. That's what's going on every single day. 
Because the day of judgment, those books will be open. The Bible and the books about your life, your lives. Because you will be here many times. All those books are going to come out. You're going to be judged based on what is written and what is written about your life, the things you've been through. That's heavy stuff, right? That is some heavy stuff. All right? Okay, go back to where was that now? Verse um, 2, no, Sirach 35 and 1. I'm sorry, Sirach 35 and 1. Let's go back there. I know I digress, but I just needed to break the point so you can see the, the importance of the journey of your repentance. Very important. Sirach 35 and 1. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 35, verse 1. Uh -huh. He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. Come on. He that taketh heed to the commandments offereth a peace offering. Offereth a peace offering. So when we keep God's commandments, we are offering a peace offering. Jump down to verse 4. Watch this. Verse 4. Thou shalt not appear empty before the Lord. He says you cannot appear empty before the Lord. Meaning what? You cannot appear, be you cannot go and appear before the Lord, but you are empty. Meaning what? You don't have works good for repentance. You're not, you're not keeping the commandments. You understand? Uh, 